we've seen the fastest economic growth in over a decade, our deficits cut by two-thirds, a stock market that has doubled, and health care inflation at its lowest rate in 50 years. The President of the United States has plenty of opportunity to speak to the American people. At any time and from almost any place, he or she is at the moment. Tuesday evening, President Barack Obama either delivered one of the more thrilling and powerful speeches in recent political memory, or he continued on his course of lame duck Harry Carey by spitting in the face of his enemies and assuring there will not be one moment of cooperation from here until the next election. Choose your side. Strap on the Kevlar vest. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Midpoint. From the right, Executive Director of the Independent Women's Forum and contributing author of Lean Together, Sabrina Schaefer. And from the left, former Deputy, uh, Deputy Staff Secretary to President Bill Clinton and Democratic Strategist, David Goodfriend. Good to see you both again. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank for you. having me. All right, David, here you go. I'm going to start with you. And here comes the first thing that you have to react to. The president last night stretched the truth. He lied to the American people. He was arrogant. He was only using his pulpit to make the GOP look bad and basically setting it up for the 2016 election for the Democrats. Go. Well, I certainly disagree with that. He was reciting facts, not lies. He was talking about, uh, as you heard in that clip, a stock market that's doubled, unemployment that's gone down, job creation that's gone up. But I also want to say, uh, maybe I'm an optimist here, but I viewed his discussion of tax policy as an opening to a compromise, uh, a big deal with the Republican Congress, because we all know that Republicans would like to reform the tax code. And I viewed his speech as this. He was saying, if we can do tax cuts for the middle class, if we can do child care tax credits, if we can do things that actually help working people, the end of that sentence is, let's talk about your ideas, Republicans, when it comes to lowering the corporate tax rate, doing corporate tax reform, closing loopholes. I see the makings of a deal here that, far from being gridlock forever, actually an opening gambit for a negotiation that could result in real legislation like what Ronald Reagan did in 1986. All right, Sabrina, your turn. Answer back on that. Well, I always like to hear some optimism, but I'm not sure I was quite as optimistic. I mean, what I heard was a lot of the same old rhetoric that we have been hearing for the past six years, sort of a, a notion that we live in a zero-sum game where we can't actually grow the pie for everyone. We have to sort of pit Americans against one another and decide who's going to be the winner and who's going to be the loser. And I think much of what we heard about was sort of how we're going to take from the wealthy, take from Wall Street to give to the middle class, um, that we are going to continue to give uh, uh, more, quote, benefits, which we all know are not free. We all know that these um, are going to come at the burden of the American taxpayer. Um, and whether we're talking about free community college or free paid leave um, or, or greater tax benefits, I think one of the things that we would all like to see is government taking a step out so that people have more control and choices over their lives rather than depending on government, whether we're talking about health care, education, or the workplace. All right, Sabrina, now I'm going to go ahead and bring one to you. Here's your side of it all. Hey, Sabrina, the president was right last night. It's time for this 1% of 1% to start paying more into this. They're making too much money. The middle class needs them. It's about time they decided that it was good to share with everybody else and be part of America right now. Go. Well, look, I can, I can sympathize. I'm not part of that 1%. I have a young family of little children at home. Both my husband and I work. It is hard. But what makes it harder are many of the policies that Washington has put out there. What's making it harder is that I know that my premiums under Obamacare are going to be going up dramatically over the next two years. What makes it harder is that my taxes are going to support things like his Healthy Families Act, which is going to reduce wages and limit jobs, especially for women. What's going to make it harder is that he's going to continue taxing us to pay for projects like the community you know, free community college. So there's lots that government can do to make my life easier that doesn't require us pitting Americans against one another because one day I hope to be part of that 1%. I hope to be making more money and I don't want to have a disincentive to get there. David, we know you're not part of the 1%, but now you get to go ahead and answer back. Well, <laughs> I like to focus again on where we're in agreement. Today when I turn on the TV and I look at Newsmax, I see Republicans in Congress talking about how to help the middle class. Let's stop right there. That's a great result of this State of the Union speech. Oh, but wait a minute, having... David. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. The yeah. Republicans have always said, let's help the middle class. This is nothing new, but they've always said, who's going to pay for it? Well, I, I beg to differ. I mean, a lot of times we've talked about, we've heard from Republicans, the repeal of Obamacare, the undoing of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act. A lot of that I'm not hearing today. Today what I'm hearing from Republicans is, yeah, the middle class does need help, but we have a different idea for how to get there. Great. Let's have that debate. But let's acknowledge 
that America's middle class used to be the driving force of the entire world's economy is under siege right now and that it should be a different situation in America. We should have a growing and vibrant middle class, not one under siege. All right, go ahead, Sabrina. Go ahead, Sabrina. I know that you're biting again on this. Yeah, well, I do agree. I mean, look, I think that there's a lot that we can do, but I worry when I hear the president talk about investing, for instance, in high-speed rail. This is what we see California doing. We know the state of affairs in, in California are dire. We know that we don't necessarily need, you know, billions of dollars invested in high-speed rail, rail, yet that's um, something that the president is talking about, about looking at. And I worry that we're sort of throwing spaghetti at the wall rather than allowing the money to stay in the pockets of American businesses and American individuals and let them determine where it's going to be best used rather than trying to you know, have someone in Washington say, hey, I think this year this is a good idea. And next year, that's a good idea. That is not the way the economy works productively. 90 seconds here. All right. OK, wait a minute. Go ahead, David. You got something. Well, I just want to ask Sabrina a question. This is a genuine question. I mean, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, not exactly a socialist organization, has for a long time supported infrastructure spending as a very productive way to help the economy because it's something we need for business in order to grow whether it's roads or telecommunications lines or airports, and it's a way to make sure that we have jobs that go to the middle class. That is something the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has supported. So when the president last night said, hey, let's think big. It's not just about one oil pipeline. Let's think big about public infrastructure. Would you agree with that? It sounds like that was something right out of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce playbook. 45 seconds, Sabrina. I think that we want to focus on infrastructure as needed, but I think too often we're talking about infrastructure as a shortstop to sort of providing jobs for the next six months or a year. But what would really allow for greater job creation is if we, you know, rein in the progressive state, get rid of a, a whole host of regulations, especially those imposed by the EPA, if we give more money back to businesses and individuals so that they can invest it wisely. That would be a more efficient use of resources rather than someone in Washington trying to determine where those resources are most needed. All right, can I get both of you maybe for a, a, a chorus of kumbaya? I mean, is <laughs> Of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm about moving the ball forward. <laughs> okay. Now, I can get the two of you to do it. Now, can I get Harry Reid, uh, Mitch McConnell, and the president and John Boehner to sing all together? Oh, I don't. I'm not sure <laughs> I want to comment on that. <laughs> no, I'll comment on that. Five seconds. Go. Five seconds. They still want to matter, and they still want to do things, and that common interest will bring them to a compromise on something this Congress, I'm convinced. We'll make that the final word this time around. Sabrina Schaefer, David Goodfriend, good to see you again. We'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks. Thank you. All right, here's something any side can agree on. It's a Google world, and we all must learn to live in it.